Many men. Well, folks, I want you to get your Bibles, if you would, with me this morning, please. Turn to the book of Mark, Gospel of Mark, chapter 5. If you'd like to stand, we read God's infallible Word. If it's God's Word, it's infallible, isn't it? We receive it not as the Word of man, but as it is the Word of God. Mark chapter number 5, Mark chapter 5, and verse 1. They came over unto the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains. Because he had, because he had, because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him. And cried with a loud voice, saying, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. For he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked asked him, What is thy name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion. For we are many. Notice the change from singular to plural. My name is Legion, for we are are many. And he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country. There was there nigh unto the mountains a great herd of swine feeding. And all the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine that we may enter into them. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave, and the unclean spirits went out, and entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. They were about two thousand, and were choked in the sea. Father, in Jesus' name, use what I've said now here, Lord. In thy name we pray. Glorify thyself, and amen. You can be seated. This is probably one of the most classical of all of the incidences in the New Testament of a confrontation between the Lord Jesus Christ, the Prince of Light, and the world of darkness. And you can see without question that the Lord Jesus Christ is infinitely superior to any demon, any devil, any Satan, any wicked spirit, any evil spirit. He is infinitely superior. By his leave, the Bible says, they were allowed to scurry out of that man as quickly as they could and go into the herd of swine. They said their name was Legion. Do a little research and you'll find out a Roman legion was about 6,000 troops, but that varied. That's a lot of demons in one individual. How he got all these demons... Nobody tells us. But that this man was in horrible condition, the Bible is very clear. Last Sunday morning I preached to you a message about a religious man that was lost. His name was Nicodemus. He was a ruler of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said, Rabbi, we know thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do the things that thou doest except God be with him. The Lord Jesus Christ said, Nicodemus, you must be born again. Nicodemus needed to be born again. He needed the new birth. You can go from church after church after church throughout this country and throughout this world with crosses hanging all over their buildings and all kind of religious symbols. Much religious tradition. But to hear a message on the new birth would be a very rare thing. There are people in this town who go to church every time the doors are open and have not heard a message about the new birth since they've been in that church. Don't have a clue that they must be born again. 
Here in the book of Mark, chapter number 5, you have another confrontation. This was on an entirely different scale as the one between Nicodemus and the Lord Jesus Christ. Nicodemus came to him respecting him because he undoubtedly realized that the Lord Jesus Christ spoke with authority and knowledge vastly superior and far beyond any teacher that he had ever heard. Here is a man, though, in the book of Mark, chapter number 5, that's out of his mind. A man who lives in the tombs and goes in the mountains. A man who screams at night, cuts himself, who is living in a living hell. He's living in a place where no one would want to live. Who wants to live in a graveyard? Yet the Bible says that's where he was. The Bible says that this is called the land of the Gadarenes. At the time of Christ, 2,000 years ago, there was an area in the northern part around Galilee called the Decapolis. And it consisted of ten cities. And these were, Jew these were Greek cities that, uh, in a lot of ways, disdained Judaism and hated the Jews. And undoubtedly we have that here because we have people who are raising swine, keeping pigs... And of course, a pig is a cursed thing in the temple and among Jews. So we find the Lord Jesus Christ of all things going into a, in, into a, into a Greek city, into a foreign city, into, into the town of the enemy, not into a Jewish stronghold. And when he goes there, he goes there, my friend, not just casually and finds out what happens. Everywhere the Lord Jesus Christ ever went, there was a reason for him going there. I believe every step that he ever took, it's because somebody needed him. He said, I have needs to go through Samaria. I've got meat to eat that you know not of. And of course, there was a Samaritan woman that went to the well that day that needed the Lord Jesus Christ. Went out of his way for one woman. So there's no doubt in my mind that he took this trip into, into the land of the Gergesenes. It says in another gospel, the Gadarenes was the, Gadara was the city and the Gergesene was the area. And here he's confronted with a demon-possessed man living in hell. Some of you may be living in hell this morning. I'm talking about living in a living hell. Or you may find yourself spiraling downward into a living hell. You see it coming. Maybe you've been there before. Maybe you know what it's all about. And some, somehow for a while you got out of it and now you're headed right back into it again. You felt like you got victory over it. And for a while you might have and rejoiced in it. And now you're headed right back into it again. I want to tell you something. God uses circumstances. Sometimes He, he takes a circumstance that's out of your control to get your attention. Sometimes He'll lock you up in a prison, a maximum security prison. And my friend, you'll think they've thrown the keys away. But then a, then a missionary will come by. And he'll hand you a track and preach to you and show you the love of Christ. In that dark hole and there you'll get saved. You'll thank God for the day that you went to prison. Because it was there you met the Lord Jesus Christ. Some of you are addicted to drugs. You don't want people to know about it, but I'm going to tell you something. There's a drug called methamphetamine. A few months back I read a, uh, I, I read a poem about that drug. I read that poem and a lot of you folks were very impressed with what that young lady had to say. If you get on the internet and do a few searches, you'll find out that that poem is all over the web. You'll find out that most of the time they attribute it to a young woman in her 20s. And they say that they found it in a drawer of a, of, of a piece of furniture after she died. And they read that poem and realized what a horrible, horrible world that she was in. I've got that poem this morning and I want to make it available to you. We'll get our secretary to run off copies for you. Anybody like to have this? <coughs> we want you to have this poem because people need to hear it. The poem starts out and says, I destroy homes and tear families apart. It does. Methamphetamines is called the poor man's cocaine. Cocaine's expensive. That's my understanding. You've got to have money to buy that. The rich kids from West Knoxville drive over here to Martin Luther King Boulevard and that's where they buy their cocaine. The rich kids do. But if you're not one of the rich kids, then you, you get methamphetamines because they're cheaper. They make it out here in the woods somewhere. They make it in some dirty trailer somewhere. And that's your, that's, that's your poor man's cocaine. The thing about uh, methamphetamines is this. That if you ever get addicted to crystal meth, it's referred to, you won't be able to hide it. Because it will take its toll on your looks. People will be able to look at you and tell that you are addicted to methamphetamines. You may be able to hide pot. You may be able to hide some of this other stuff for a while. But you won't hide that. And you will descend into a literal hell. 
This poem's long, I won't read all of it, but it says many things about what crystal meth can do. Here's the last thing that it says. Now that you've met me, what will you do? Will you try me or not? It's all up to you. I can show you more misery than your words can tell. Come take my hand. Let me lead you to hell. And laugh in your face while it, face while it does. Are you saying, now preacher, Christ, crystal meth couldn't do that to me. Here's the face of a little three-year-old girl. Little children around meth addicts pick up this stuff. I mean, there's all kinds of infections associated with it. And the little children are, are not exempt. And their little faces show what happens in homes where crystal meth is found. It's miserable. It's pitiful. There's one thing that happens to meth addicts and it's called, a, it's like they feel like, they feel like bugs are crawling around under their skin and they scratch and they, and they literally scratch so much that they scratch big holes in their skin. There's a photograph of that. Just a little bit of the kind of thing that happens to people that are hooked on drugs. Hooked on drugs. American society is a drugged society. I'd say probably a lot of you in this house this morning have tried marijuana. You've tried crystal meth. You've tried cocaine, crack cocaine. You've tried, you, you've tried uh, uh, barbiturates and all the rest of the stuff that goes with it. I mean, it's a long list of the drugs that Americans are hooked on today. And not only that, but prescription drugs. Some folks get hooked on them too. And they begin to eat away at your very soul. They eat away at your life. They put you in a time somewhere along the line where you say to yourself, there's no hope for me. I can't get out of this. I've got to have this to live. Now all you've got to do is follow the news in the last few weeks and you're seeing one after another after another die. Big names all over the country. And they're dying as a direct result of drugs. Drugs, no respecter of person. Drugs, a straight road to hell. Drugs, cut your life short and ruin every hope that you ever had. Drugs will lock you up in a prison and they'll throw the key away. They might as well because as soon as you get out, you'll go right back to your drugs again. Prostitutes standing on the streets here in Knoxville, Tennessee, right now selling their body because they want more drugs. They have to have drugs. And they're walking zombies. I've never seen as many faces in my life that are as empty as they can be. You look into their eyes and there's nobody responding. There's nobody looking back. It's like they're looking through you. They don't care. They're not alive anymore. They live for their drugs. Somehow I wish I could get that over. But kids are going to experiment. You're going to think you're, you're invincible. You think you're, you think you're smarter than we are. You think you know you can just go out and control it and you can, you can get the pleasure out of your drugs. But they won't take you captive, but they will. They will. They'll lock you up in a hell you wish you'd never been born. They say this one right here, that she, this, this young woman that wrote this poem, she for a while got free of methamphetamines and then they, they put their clutches around her once again. And I don't know what it is to be addicted to drugs. Thank God I don't. If, I had, if they'd had them when I was a kid growing up, I'd probably have been in it. I'm mean, nothing great about me. I'd, I'm sure I'd probably been tried everything under the sun, but I didn't. I'm thank God that's one battle I have never had to fight. I have never had to fight an addiction to drugs, but I've watched people do it. You better believe I've been there. I've been to the counseling centers. I've been to the hospitals. I've been friend out there with them. I've been with them when they're high. I've been with them when they're coming down. I've been with them when they're in hell trying to help them. And I know what drugs can do. You say, well, now, preacher, it's not going to bother me. It'll bother you. It'll bother you. Let me tell you something about what I'm preaching on this morning. I firmly believe that the greatest problem in this country is not sex. I believe the greatest problem in this country is drugs. I believe that drug addicts are wearing badges, sitting on judges' benches, carrying stethoscopes around their necks. I believe that drug addicts are sitting on the boards of these, of these banks. I believe drug addicts are sitting in the White House around the table with the President of the United States. I believe that drug addicts are carrying four stars on their shoulders. I believe drug addicts are in the highest positions in this country. And some of those drug addicts are making the laws. A man said to me one time, he said, rich men write the laws. And I thought to myself, that's very true. 
That's why a poor man lives and dies with a stranglehold around his soul. Drugs, why don't they do something about it? Why don't they stop it? Why don't they take the one that introduces drugs to you and hold him up for the community to see the devil that he is? But the problem is that once they get hooked on drugs, they'll do anything to get more drugs. And that means sell drugs and sell their body to get drugs. Our country and our churches are full of that. Church, did I get up here and preach the message about the house of God and what goes on in the house of God? I no sooner preached that than here they are arresting them out of the very house of God that I'm talking about. And I didn't have a clue. But I just know what goes on inside the church house. I know that if everybody in here this morning were born again, if you were truly saved by the grace of God, what started back here in the choir would have exploded out into the congregation. And you've been praising and glorifying God. You've been walking around saying hallelujah to God. Thank God I'm saved. Hallelujah. I'm saved. Hallelujah. But most people are scared to death when I preach like this. They don't understand what I'm talking about. Because they're accustomed to going to churches where they worship. They worship. Come worship with us. No, come hear the Word of God with us. Get saved. Then you can worship. An unsaved man cannot worship God. But they're not interested in getting you saved. They're interested in building a congregation, filling a house full of people. And that's what it's all about. You must be born again. And here's what I want you to see about this. What's the most marvelous thing about it? It is the Bible says that no man could tame him. That he was bound with chains and fetters and he bust them loose. He was literally beyond control and he was without hope. He was living in the tombs and in the nighttime he'd go across the mountains and scream and curse and blaspheme God. I'll tell you something. When the Lord Jesus Christ showed up, hope showed up. That's what I love about the gospel. I'm going to tell you something. Listen to me, please. I don't care how deep the hole. I don't care how dark the night. I don't care how lost you find yourself. Jesus Christ can save. Amen. Some of the hardest people to get saved are those people that come to church every Sunday and they're full of religion. And I'm not going to preach about Nicodemus again. I preached about him last Sunday. But oh, I've dealt with Nicodemus. I've dealt with religious people. I've dealt with people that got a head full of knowledge and a heart full of hell. Amen. A head full of knowledge and a heart full of hell. Wouldn't give you air if you stopped up in a jug. Wouldn't lift you up if you'd fallen. Stomp you on down when you're down. Help kicking you on, kick you on out and be done with you. There was no hope for him. Nobody could help him. Maybe you find yourself there. Maybe you're covering up for the kind of life that you're living. Maybe you won't even come face to face with. Maybe you won't even, you're living in denial. Maybe you're doing things that you wouldn't want anybody to find out about. Maybe your computer's full of child pornography. Maybe you've got a mistress somewhere. Man, the, 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 the governor of South Carolina, he could afford to fly to Argentina. <laughs> Plane tickets are expensive. Maybe you're meeting somebody in uh, Murfreesboro, Middlesboro, Nashville, Asheville. You think you've got it all covered up and you're hiding. But the truth of the matter is, the Bible says plainly, that every secret will be made known. Open to the eyes of Him are all things with whom we have to do. Are you listening? He wants you to come to Him just as you are. Just like this man in this condition. You won't meet anybody worse than that. You couldn't sit out and carry on a conversation with a demon-possessed man. Given the right circumstances, he'd kill you. The kicking doors down, coming into your homes, home invaders. You can't even be safe in your own home. If I were writing the laws in the state of Tennessee and in this country, I'd put at the very top of the list, death penalty when you come into a man's home. I would hold that, I would make that a worse felony than bank robbery. Why? If you are not safe in your homes, you're not safe anywhere. Amen. You live in a demon possessed society. People are rational today. They don't care. One guy broke into a car the other day, took this woman, jerked her out of her car, threw her down, took off with her car, drove up here, I think, Lake City or somewhere, robbed a place, came back into town and robbed another place. And they finally called him. All this happened one day. He went wild. Went crazy. 
a crime spree. And it's just waiting to happen. You're living in a society that plays with demons. You go home and turn your television set on. You go watch the prime time slop at night. Sitcom one right after another. This one fornicating with that one. This one fornicating with that one. This one blaspheming. That one blaspheming. Turn that sewage off and get it out of your house. How can you live on a diet of constant sewage and expect to walk with God? It fills your mind, your head. It perverts your thoughts. And it allows demons to come into your life. This prisons in this country are full of men and they'll say this, I don't know what it was, but I had a thought come to me that just said, shoot your wife, shoot your children. I just couldn't resist it. It was so powerful. I just had to do it. And so I got a gun and I shot my wife and I shot my children. And they say to him, why'd you do it? Why'd you kill your family? I don't know why. I just had this thought come into my mind and it was so powerful I couldn't stop it. I just had to kill them. That's called demonism. That's demon possession. That's demon influence. I've had a number of people tell me recently, Preacher, I had a thought come to my mind, and this thought came to my mind and said, Just blow your brains out. And I had to resist it because the thought just came into my mind all of a sudden from nowhere, and it said, Blow your brains out. Crazy stuff. You say, Where'd that come from? That comes from demons. I think we ought to spend a lot more time preaching to the church today and trying to warn Christians about the kind of culture you're living in. Your television sets, the whole media, everything. The music, if you want some of that stuff's not music. But this stuff they're listening to today, it's a venue, an avenue, a, de- a door, a way for demons to come into your life. And they'll destroy you. They will destroy you. I've never seen anything like it in my life. I've never seen the way people just go off the deep end. They just lose it. For some reason they go completely screaming mad. And do things that they, a rational person wouldn't do. And they wind up down here at Brushy Mountain. Or some other maximum security prison. And then they're sitting on death row. And then they take their life away. We've got four people sitting in jail here in Knoxville, Tennessee right now. That's been sitting in jail for over two and a half years. Waiting for their trial to begin. And next month, the trial for the first one begins. Supposed to, unless they put it off again. August. Of a crime that happened over two and a half years ago. And what they did is unspeakable. It's unspeakable. I'm, I, I just still, I have, I, I, when it happened, I said, Lord God Almighty, how can, how, can, how can this happen? How can people be so cruel? How can they... Even a preacher, a Baptist preacher, preached as much as I have, as long as I have, read the Bible as much as I have. When I see something like that happen, it just blows my mind. And I think, how can somebody be so cruel? I mean, it's one thing to murder somebody, and that's bad. But what they did before the murder, and they haven't even tried them yet. I'll bet if you got those guys out and... Started questioning them, asking them what happened. They may tell you they had voices in their head. They may tell you one thing led to another. They may tell you something happened, they got together, and you never know what you're going to hear coming out of the mind, the soul, of somebody that's in a dark hole like that. And I'm telling you that some of you may be standing on the very verge of stepping off into a hole like that, and you don't even know it. Have you been acting irrational lately? Have a lot of thoughts been flying into your head? Have you been wanting to do things that you never thought you'd ever want to do? Have you been, has your life begun to change? Well, I'm going to tell you something right now. If it's demons, you can always trace it back to a point when it started and what caused it to start. Don't play with them, folks. Don't play with evil spirits. The Lord Jesus Christ never did any more with one than cast it out. There was never a dialogue. Always a confrontation. You're gone. And that's what we do. You're gone. And it'll go. In the name of the Lord. 
Some of you this morning need demons cast out of you. Some of you need to be saved. Some of you need help and deliverance because some of you are addicted to drugs and you think you're getting along just fine right now. You're dilly-dallying, playing. You're trying this, trying that, experimenting with this and experimenting with that. That's the great downfall of kids, teenagers. They like to experiment. And they got Facebook and MySpace. If ever something was invented for a gossiper, boy, that is. That's gossip heaven. But I'm going to tell you something about Facebook and MySpace. It's getting weird. They communicate and try things. They talk in codes now. They got their own coded language where they can be talking and you don't have a clue what they're saying. That's what's going on. They call them social interaction spots. Parents, you'd better watch carefully where your kid is on the internet. Well, my kid doesn't mess with pornography. What about verbal pornography? And what about mind pornography? What about a place like that? Not only is MySpace and Facebook a possible venue for a predator to come on there and get you and trace down your children and come and take them when they don't have enough sense to not get on there and reveal their name, their address, their phone number, put a photograph of themselves on there. Some fellow in Ohio or some guy in Wyoming can get on there and act like he's a 17-year-old boy talking to one of you girls and he's a 55 year old predator and make a date with you and he'll take you you say well I appreciate what I'm telling you this is 2009 you think that the obvious would be obvious but it's not with some people you say well I can trust my kids can you really I saw a bumper sticker the other day said do you know where your cat is tonight (laughs) That was pretty good. Cats are nocturnal creatures. I think the... I know know it's a joke, but the point is they made a point. Do you know where your kid is tonight? Do you know who they're sneaking off with? Do you know what they're doing? Do you know who their friends are? I'm trying to preach to the young generation. And hear me now and hear me well. They're not your friend if they're giving you dope. And the boys don't love you if all they want out of you is sex. The boys don't love you and they're not your friend. That's your enemy. Kids, the vast majority of the young people out here have been indoctrinated into this culture. They are as perverted in their mind as they can possibly be. And they don't have a clue what righteousness and holiness is about. And you're raising a generation of children up in this American culture. You're raising a generation of children up in American culture. American culture with its music. American culture with its immorality. American culture with its perversion. American culture with its easy lifestyle where Instant gratification. American culture that's probably outside of ancient Rome, one of the most perverted cultures this world has ever known. Amen. But there's hope. Now, kids, let me tell you something. I'm going to talk to the children for just a minute. When I was 15 years old, I had a little buddy at Rural High School. We thought we were something. We'd lay out of school, we'd go down on the railroad tracks, and we'd take us, we'd get us a bottle of of, uh, gin or something like that, and we'd sit down on the railroad tracks and we'd get drunk. 15, 16, somewhere in there, just a kid. I saw his sister here about a year ago, and he's been long dead. So apparently he didn't meet God, and apparently he didn't get any help, and apparently the Lord didn't do anything for him, and, and he just kept going down to the railroad tracks and drinking his gin, and he died a long time ago. Do you know what gin will do to your liver? Do you know what it will do to your brain? Do you know what vodka will do to your kidneys? Do you know what alcohol will do to you? Alcohol is poison. Do you know all that? You don't see any old drunks. No old drunks around. Drunks dry young. Okay? But kids, you're coming up now. You're being subjected to every kind of filth and perversion there is. Please, in the name of Jesus... Say no to it.
turn away from it. Your life's worth more than that garbage. It's worth more than that. Come to the Lord. If you've been doing this, you can come and confess it to Him. You don't have to confess it to me. You don't have to tell anybody about it. Somebody holds something over your head. You don't have to do that. Confess it to the Lord. And you confess it to the Lord, and He'll forgive you of it. Save you. And give you power to overcome it. Now here's the next thing to do. The first thing to do is get right. second thing to do is get new friends. Get new friends. New friends. Well, preacher, you just don't know, preacher. The very ones that are trying to get me to do it come to church. Okay, I know they come to church. Maybe they do come to church. Don't sit on that side of the church. Shun them. If your friends are coming into this church and they're a bunch of dopeheads and fornicators and blasphemers, get away from them. Find you some friends in here that aren't like that. You say, preacher, I can't believe you're preaching like that. Listen, friend, I'm an old 62-year-old man. Good night. There's child molesters, fornicators, perverts going to the churches in these towns. You can't walk in a church house anymore and look around the people sitting next to you and think you're sitting in the midst of a bunch of saints. Everything in the world comes into the church house. But I want the kids to know this. The kids need to understand this. Kids need to understand that there could be danger in here. Get away from them. How many agree with that? You parents. Shun them. And get with the kids that don't live like that. How many of you kids in here this morning raise your hand and say, Preacher, that's what I'm going to do. If somebody's going to try to sell me dope, somebody try to get me off into sex, somebody's going to try this, I'm going to get me another crowd to run with. Raise your hands. Come on, kids, raise your hands. Make a covenant with God this morning. So I don't care who it is. I don't care if it's the deacon's daughter or if it's the preacher's son. It doesn't matter who it is. I'm getting away from them. Amen. Father, you saw the hands that went up. Lord, you know what I'd change if I could. You know what I'd do with the public system, public school system if I could, don't you, Lord? You know what I'd do in a heartbeat. But, Father, I don't have that power. But, Lord, this morning we do have this. We've got the gospel, and we've preached it. And I think some of these young people in here this morning heard something that they didn't expect to hear. And Father, I know in my heart and in my soul, Lord, it's not all right at Temple. I know it's not. It's not. We've got kids in here that I wouldn't recommend other kids to walk with. I'm sure of that. I'm sure we've got that. No doubt in my mind. Why are we so different from anybody else? But I do believe, Lord, we've got kids in here too that are good kids and they love the Lord. And they want to be around good kids. And they don't need to be around temptation and those that are trying to pull them down hurt them. And I pray for them. But I pray for those kids in here this morning that are messed up. I pray for the kids in here today, Heavenly Father, who are making a joke out of it and laughing at everything. To them, it's just a, it's, to them, it's just a one big party. I pray you'd speak to them, Lord. Speak to those kids. Show them how quickly they can come to their end. How quickly they could be living a life of pure hell like this demoniac here in Gadara. I pray for them. I pray for them in Jesus' name. And for Jesus' sake, I ask it. <coughs> Heads are bowed. Eyes are closed. Nobody looking. I've been preaching to you for two weeks now. I've been preaching to you about where you live and who you are. It doesn't do any good, folks, to come into church and talk about all the great things we believe and the great, all the great uh, doctrines of the Bible and all the great, great, great and go out and live like hell itself. It doesn't do any good. It just makes a joke out of it. There aren't many churches left in this country, I firmly believe, that have any kind of the Spirit of God in them. And I'm thankful to the Lord for what we have here at Temple. Hallelujah to God. But I know one thing. If we ever sink into what so many churches have sunk into, and, Lord, and anything goes, and there's, no, there's, no, there's no, no preaching, no standard, no nothing, then you can mark it down. You'll see the day come when the Holy Ghost goes out that back door and you don't see Him again. And nothing is any deader than a dead church. The Lord Jesus said the church is the salt of the earth. And he said if the salt loses its savor, it's good for nothing. Can you imagine being good for nothing? Good for nothing. Man, good for nothing. That can happen. I don't want it to happen here. I tell you, Jesus is coming soon. 
to a Sunday school class this morning. I read this little article I took off the Internet this morning right before church about Al Gore, the illustrious former senator from Tennessee. Al Gore, the former vice president, Al Gore, has publicly stated now that the purpose of this, of this, uh, of uh, the cap and trade and all this stuff about uh, global warming is to create a global governance. He's made it plain, a global government, a one world government. That's exactly what the Antichrist is looking for, a one world government. We're there. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. The rapture is going to take place Amen. soon. Amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Yes. In thy name we pray, Lord. Amen. Let's stand up. Brother.